we're continuing our series on we are church. We are, we are God's people. We are his plan A to reach the nations of the world. And we've been unpacking what that means, who we are, what we're about, and what God's design actually is for us. I want to ask you a question before we come to God's word together. Have you ever been entrusted to look after something for someone else? Have you ever had somebody ask you to house sit for them while they go on holidays or maybe look after one of their pets. I remember hearing a story a few years ago about someone who had been asked to look after some of the pet rabbits uh, for their little girl and they, and they went on holidays. This person had agreed to look after the rabbit. They went on the first day to feed the rabbits and they noticed that one of them had died on the first day. There was another 13 days to go. And they thought, oh no, what are we going to do? This rabbit has died. So they take a photograph and they go out to a pet shop and try and find a rabbit that looks just the same. And they put this rabbit in the hutch and they bury the other rabbit and the owners return 13 days later. And they are really concerned and they come up to the person who looked after them and said, Do you know, before we went away, we meant to tell you that one of the rabbits had died. But it seems to have come back to life. <laughs> have you ever been entrusted to look after something, to look after someone's plants, and you just forget to do it, and on day 13, you water two weeks worth of water <laughs> into that thing? Because the return date becomes quite important. I remember that TV advert a number of years ago that was advertising yellow pages and it showed a story of a young lad who was looking after his parents' home while they were on holiday and he had had a big party, he had all his mates around and the house was an absolute mess and he thought that he had enough time just to clear it all up but there were some scratch marks on one of their very expensive pieces of antique so he finds, phones the yellow pages, finds a French polisher that polishes it up and just as the parents arrive it's all finished and done looking after things for other people can feel a great responsibility and knowing that the point that they return that becomes a very scary moment in that responsibility because it's at that moment that the test happens to see whether you did a good job or not and we're going to look at a scripture that shows us so much that God has entrusted something to us and he is returning. So I'd like you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 25. We're going to read quite a number of verses together from Matthew 25. And we're going to start from verse 13, which looks like it's attached to the previous story. Some commentators say that it is, and some say that it really should be attached to the beginning of the next story. Because there are three stories that Jesus told together. One is the parable of the ten virgins. The other one that we're looking at today is the parable of the talents. And then another one that follows the sheep and the goats. And there's quite a synergy and a connectivity of these stories. But we're going to go right into the middle of the second one of these three. And it's the parable of the talents. Verse 13 of Matthew 25. Have you got a Bible? If you haven't, then you've got the words on the screen. So I invite you to read along with me. And it says this, again, it, uh, sorry, verse 13, therefore keep watch because the owners of that rabbit or plant might return one day. <laughs> therefore keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. That's the worst sort of looking after something for someone. You don't quite know when you need to be ready for Verse 14, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and he entrusted his wealth to them. To one, he gave five bags of gold. To another, two bags. And to another, one bag. Each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and he gained five more bags. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received just one bag 
went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned, and he settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with the five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man, man who had received the one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, that you harvest where you have not sown and gather in where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So apparently you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and, you get, and I, that I gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him, give it to the one who has 10 bags, for whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw the worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. A very, very familiar story that I'm sure you've heard numerous sermons on in the past. And we have to navigate this story with great care because there are a number of things in there that we could read into this that Jesus is not trying to communicate or not saying. So we have to be very, very careful when we come to God's word that we don't just immediately take a word that relates to something in our modern context and jump on the bandwagon of believing that's what it means. We must look at the context, the understanding, the background to understand what it is that actually is attempting to be said here. There's a, depending on which version you use, this story is often more known as the parable of the talents. We, in the version, the New International Version I just read from, it describes pots of gold. But the talent is what it's mostly referred to. And for many people reading and interpreting this, it's almost like the Master's Got Talent contest. This is uh, the, 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 the eternal version of Britain's Got Talent where God sits at the judge to see whether someone has deployed and employed those abilities that are within them to see if they do a good job with them. And if they do, they go through to the next round and maybe stardom and fame is on their doorstep. If they don't, then it's uh -uh, cast out into the utter darkness. And it would be really easy to interpret that word talent with our modern understanding of the word and see that this is a story that's about using the abilities that you have within you. But I want to explore that with caution, and I'm going to explain why in just a moment. Because Jesus, is he presenting this master's got talent? Is it about whether you play the piano and whether you're using that for the Lord? Is it about that you have a gift of hospitality and are you using that for the Lord? Is it about you're good at kids' work and are you using that for the Lord? If you are, you'll do more with kids' work. If you don't, then uh -uh. Is that what Jesus is saying? If so, it would be easy to preach this as a story to get us all to engage in the activities of the church and apply our gifts and talents. But is this really what Jesus is saying? 
Also, another thing we have to be cautious about when we look at these verses together, is it saying that service is an opportunity to earn rewards? Because on first glance, that could be what it's saying here. And I want to explore that and see whether that's what Jesus is actually trying to communicate. So let's look a little bit closer at what Jesus is actually saying here. First question I want to ask is, what are the talents? Well, in the time that this was written, the time that Jesus told the story, a talent would have been um, a defined weight of silver or gold. It was a, it was a, you know, a categorical amount. And while the value of that gold or the value of that silver may have fluctuated according to what was happening in the markets, it would have meant a fixed weight. And it was worth a lot. Some commentaries will say that this was probably worth the equivalent of about 20 years worth of salary. It's quite a lot of money. This was quite a moment. This was a dragon's den moment of putting a serious investment into these servants. So... The understanding was that this was monetary, but is Jesus talking about money here? Is he talking about playing the piano? Is he talking about doing kids' work? Is he talking about money? Well, we're going to just tease this out a little bit. First of all, I'm going to apply four clues that tell us what this really is about. First one is the clue of ownership. First of all, we read that the master entrusted his wealth or his property to the servants. He didn't give it to them, he entrusted it to them. It wasn't theirs, it wasn't a gift, if you like, that became legally binding as theirs. They were house sitting, they were looking after, they were holding someone else's possessions and they were to understand that very carefully. I always, when I, if I put my car in for a, some repairs of the garage and they give a courtesy car, I always drive slower in the courtesy car because I see the insurance waiver that they give me that says if I have a bump, it will be something like the first 800 pound I'll be liable for. And you're just very mindful and aware that it's, it's not yours, that you're looking after it for someone and you tend to look after it more carefully. And the ownership in the story of these talents remained God's that he entrusted to his servants. So it's important that we know that. They were distributed by God, making the parallel. And you know a parable, which is what this is. Parable, I always remember it as it's an earthly story that we can relate to, but it's got a heavenly meaning. So we're trying to look at the earthly story and both the heavenly meaning. So ownership is important to note. Secondly, suitability. In verse 15, we read that the talents were given on the basis of the servant's ability. So for example, if the talent can be equated as you're good with kids' work or you're good at playing the piano, how can that be given according to your ability? Because that is ability. It doesn't quite make sense. If a talent is that you're a good singer, and then God gives you the ability to sing because you've got the ability to sing, it doesn't quite work. So that might give a little bit of a clue what this talent is being referred to here. How can God distribute ability on the basis of someone's natural ability? Thirdly, and by the way, if we look at life, we know that the same is true of finance. There are some people who've inherited lots of money And it's not necessarily because of their ability. Thirdly, there's an expectation here. It's not implicitly given, but it's it's not explicitly given, but it is implicitly given. It's implied within the context of what's said. There is an implied expectation that the servant, the servants, were to invest these talents. That they were expected to take some risks with the possibility of either gain or loss. We're not really given much detail of that. We're not really shown that Jesus gave a blueprint or the master gave a blueprint and said, now I've set these five deals up for you. Take them, do them this way. Be careful of this person. They're a bit of a, bit of a shark. You know, you have to watch out for them. We don't read the master giving that guidance. He just gave it 
And from the end of the story, we understand that he expected a return. But there was a lot of decision-making process on the part of those who were entrusted with those talents. And they were expected to be fruitful with them. But there was a risk of loss as well as gain. We're not told whether if they had incurred losses, we're not given this as an example, but if they incurred losses, was that their responsibility? Were they liable if the man with the five talents returned four, but really tried hard and risk-taking? I wonder what the master would have said. Would he have said, well done, good and faithful servant? Is Jesus interested in the fruit or was he interested in the ability for someone to apply themselves and take the risk? We're not really given that. But we do read this, that the purpose was that the investment was to be made entirely for the absent Lord. We don't read of them taking a commission or a transaction tax in the process. The energy and the work was done entirely for the benefit of the master. We don't read the man with the five talents presenting 10 to the Lord and saying, actually, there's my tithe. I'm going to keep back one and you should be really pleased because you're still getting nine where you gave me five. It seems there's a possibility that the risk was entirely upon the individual, but the gain was entirely upon the master. And in our lives, the talents, what it's referring to here, which we're just about to explore, that the master is the one who this is all done for. So to the disciples, the word talent may have represented a definite weight of gold or silver, but the parable is not confined to finance. I want to just put a, a riddle before you. What do we have which is God's particular peculiar property, which comes to us on the basis of natural ability, which requires a risk on our part, and that risk appears to entirely benefit the Lord and not ourselves? What is it? Because the answer to that riddle is what the reference of talent is in this story. What is it? Let me read that again. That is God's peculiar property, which comes to us on the basis of our natural ability, which requires a risk on our part, but it's done all for the benefit of the master. Well, if you have certain natural abilities, what do you look for to do with those natural abilities? So some of you are coming towards the end of your three-year degree or your master's or your PhD. What is the next step that you'll be looking for to do with that which you've trained and prepared for? You will be looking for opportunities to express that ability. You agree? Yeah. Two of you. <laughs> you will be looking for a way of applying all of that learning, that understanding, and that skill that you've now developed. You will be looking for a suitable opportunity. Call it a job, call it a career, call it what you want, but you will be looking for an outlet in order to do that. Rob talking about the media team earlier on, he talked about an opportunity for someone who may feel that they have a desire in that area and people will look for an opportunity. And opportunities are a really important expression of those abilities we have within us. Recognize that you have a particular gift, what is it that you then seek to do? You seek to have an opportunity to use that gift. Do we not all look for such opportunities? Young and old alike, it's not a discriminator of age. As we grow up and we feel that our powers are developing, our abilities are developing, we then begin to look for opportunities to use them. And the more talents we feel we have, the more we look for occasions or opportunities to express them. And I want to put this to you this morning. The talents... The parable of this story here is that God is presenting us with opportunities. Opportunities. What do I mean by that? Occasions that happen in our life that we may skim over, that we may, for intimidation and fear, we may miss. Opportunities that we may assume are not for us to take. And we don't use them for the Lord. And we lose them. A few years ago, I was on a youth camp 
done lots of youth camps over the years. It's part of your rites of passage of youth work. You have to sleep in canvas. And one of the things about sleeping in canvas is the shower facilities are often a little bit basic. Now, if I go back when I was a kid, that didn't matter because the boys didn't even know what a shower was back in those days. But now, they, they're all, you know, the boys are in the showers before the girls are because, you know, they want, they, they're pretty boys really, aren't they? You know, they want to do their hair and, you know, they've got all their aftershaves and they've got all their skincare products. And, uh, you know, they used to carry little toiletry bags and now they carry rucksacks with their toiletries in. And I had a bit of a routine because there was a few hundred people on this site and there was just a row of about four showers for the guys. And so it was really, really important that I got to the showers early. So I, as one of the leaders of the camp, I had this bit of a routine because my neighbor was a really early bird person. And he wasn't just prone to waking up early, he was prone to waking up early and cooking bacon early. And it was like the most wonderful alarm clock in the world ever. Because if you've ever stayed in canvas, you know that not only can you hear everything, you can smell everything. It's a very interesting experience on a youth camp. In fact, sometimes doing security late at night at a youth camp and you hear all these young people talking in their tents thinking no one can hear them and everybody can hear what they're saying. So be careful. It's, it's like the old version of Facebook status updates, you know? The next day, you have a conversation with these young people, and they say, must be a word of knowledge. How did he know that? Because you were talking about it last night in a tent. So I had this routine. My neighbor would fry his bacon, the aroma, the smell, the sizzle would all begin to fill my sleeping nostrils, and I would suddenly wake up and think, time to get up, grab my towel, get to the shower before anyone else did, and I wouldn't have a problem. But one day, my neighbor decided that he was going to change his routine. How dare he? Without consulting first with myself. And he decided that he was gonna have a lie in that morning. And so the first sound I heard was the sound of kids kicking footballs outside my tent, thud into the canvas this football went. And I looked at my watch and I thought, I'm late. Oh no, there's going to be big queues for the showers this morning. So I quickly grabbed my towel and I made my way to where the showers were. And there were about two people in front of me in the queue, so I thought not too bad. But this door, the, these four doors of showers were all closed. And I wasn't particularly feeling very sociable. I was feeling a little bit behind on the day my hair was sticking. No, it wasn't. Um, <laughs> And I stood there and these guys wanted to talk, you know, to one of the leaders about what happened the night before. And I'm thinking, just get in the shower, you know, I'm not feeling very sociable. <sighs> My breath is not really good. And, you know, it, you weren't feeling like you were in that pastoral moment, if I'm completely honest with you. So, but we talked. And then one of these shower doors opened. And this smoke rolled out from the shower door. And this lynx-smelling young guy walked out like as if he was stepping out of a stars in their eyes scene. <laughs> Looking all fresh and manicured and wonderfully tended and ready to pull some girls that day. <laughs> and the person at the front of the queue ran into the empty shower cubicle and we were, the rest of us got a little bit excited because we sort of thought, well, he's come out, the rest will soon come out as well. As this Lynx Africa guy walked past with his strong aroma, I looked behind me, there were now about four or five people in the queue behind me. So we continued our conversations and we helped each other wake up to the day a little bit. One of the people next to me was talking about something God was saying in their life. And, and as he's in the middle of talking, I'm sort of thinking, those people in the other three showers are taking a long time. What are they doing? But I'm listening to this person and... In the back of my mind, thinking, a very long time. And then I had this little question. Is anybody <laughs> in those shower cubicles? And I thought, they must be, because there was a queue here when I arrived. <laughs> so I, I just sort of quelled the rumor in my mind and thought, I'm just having silly thoughts. 
But as time stretched and went on, I, I began to think, I wonder if there really is no one in there. So I began to walk across to one of the shower doors. Now, I've got to be honest, I was a little bit concerned about the rumor of one of the leaders trying to push open the shower doors when people are in there. So I was a little bit cautious. But I walk across, and i tell you what I did first, because I'm, I'm not daft. I put my towel and my toiletry bag in the place of the queue. <laughs> so I, I know what people are like. And I walked across to the shower doors, and I went up to the first one that I'd seen no one come out of. And I just gently pushed it. And it opened, and there was this guy. No, no, there wasn't. <laughs> it was completely empty. All of that time in that queue, and that shower cubicle was empty. I hear this groan of people behind me saying, I don't believe it. What have we been queuing for? So feeling a bit buoyed by this process, I went to the second door. And I pushed it. And it was empty. I went to the third door that I'd not seen anybody come out of, and I pushed it. And it was empty. And suddenly, I thought, whoa, you leave my towel alone. It's my turn. I pick up a towel, and I run into one shower blocks, and two other people go into the other blocks. And I could not believe that we had assumed that there wasn't an opportunity. And there was. And I, when I look at my life, I wonder how many assumptions I've made of moments when there are opportunities before me that I assume, because no one else has taken them, that they no-go areas. There are things that God wants to do in this generation, in this day, that it's not a discredit to past generations at all. We build, we stand on their shoulders but there are things that God is looking for people to step out and take opportunities today that past generations have either assumed they can't take or they've not been able to take, but the timing is now. Yeah. And God wants us to test some opportunities, to push some doors, to create some space for him to show that actually he is placing before us a door that no man can shut. Talents, if in this story they are opportunities that God gave, gives us, what could they look like? Well, they can be quite varied. There's a famous missionary, Hudson Taylor, who was, was very powerfully used of God in China. 1832, he was born. 1905, he died. Hudson Taylor grew up in a Christian home had a sense of call upon his life at a very young age, and at about 15 years of age, he went off the rails. In fact, when you read old historic descriptions of what that meant at the time, it sort of implied that some of his friends got him to say curses. But he was well away from the Lord. And there was a day when he was 17 years of age. His mum was about 75 miles away from the family home. And she felt God stir her spirit to lock herself in a room and to pray for her son, Hudson. And not to come out until he said, not a very glamorous opportunity, but an opportunity. At the exact time that she decided to do that, Hudson Taylor went into a library. And as he entered the library, he was looking through some books and he found a tract, a gospel tract. And he began to read this gospel tract called It Is Finished. And as he was reading this tract, 75 miles away, his mum had locked herself in her room to pray for Hudson. And at that moment, he had an encounter with God and gave his life completely to God. You know, over the course of his life, let me just tell you what happened. He's 51 years as a missionary in China. He brought 849 missionaries to China, set up 20 mission stations, trained 700 Chinese workers, raised $4 million for missions in China, led at least 35,000 35, people to faith himself, baptized over 50,000, and established a church of 125,000. That opportunity that his mum had didn't feel very profound but it was an opportunity. And his mum was a good and a faithful steward with that opportunity. 
Another man, George Whitfield, born 1740 to 1770, one of the greatest, most famous Christians of his generation. George Whitfield was ordained an Anglican priest, but he, he just wasn't appointed to a pulpit anywhere. And he, in response to that disappointment, he began to preach in parks and fields. You know, it's said of George Whitfield's voice that you could hear his voice without any PA for five miles into the distance. George Whitfield, in this nation, he was very good friends of the Wesleys, Wesley brothers, went across to the States, and what many people refer to as the Great Awakening came through his ministry. And you know how that happened? It happened. The catalyst for it was a disappointment that he wasn't given a church. A disappointment, but that God used as an opportunity. And Whitfield took the opportunity and he stood in fields where others might have stood in pity parties. And as he stood in the field and he was a good and faithful servant, God entrusted more opportunities to him. He took more opportunities. He had more people come into faith, more opportunities to preach. See, opportunities, they're not, they don't always come with big flashing lights. They're often very subtle moments in our lives. And there are opportunities that God positions before us that we can so easily miss. But they are opportunities that are moments for us, for the master, to become a good and faithful servant. Opportunities come in various shapes and sizes. And I found this in my life, that they don't often match our expectations. They sometimes come wrapped up looking like disappointments in our lives. It's a very precious couple. I don't know them, but I've got good friends who know them very well. Zoe and Andy Clark Hoots. They, they've got two lovely children now. But they went through the grief of losing five babies. Through their pain they began to understand the pain that m many thousands of other people around the country and the world were carrying. And they responded. And they set up a ministry which is now called Say Saying Goodbye. And they hire cathedrals around the country. And they invite parents who've lost children, had miscarriages, had stillborns, lost young children, infants. And they invite them to a service where they say goodbye. The healing that God has brought into many people's lives through the opportunity that they took that looked like a disappointment has been incredible. And history is littered with stories of people who respond to disappointments and see them as a God-given opportunity. Scripture says he turns our weakness into his opportunity. That God has a way of allowing us to understand that there are sometimes seemingly insignificant things in our life that he can do great things with if only we will become a good and faithful servant. I wonder whether the person who was given one talent, you know, the three servants are lined up and the master said, I'm going away, guys. Oh, okay, it's interesting. Going anywhere nice? Yeah, I'm going on a mission trip to Mallorca. <laughs> While I'm gone, I'm going to give all of my belongings to you. And I've been watching you. I've looked, I've understood your abilities, your aptitude, and your competencies. And um, I'm going to give you five talents. A hundred years worth of salary to look after. Thank you very much. The other two stood there. I wonder if they think, wow, we're all going to get this. Or maybe I might even get more. Second servant, Master said, I'm going to give you two talents, 40 years worth of salary to look after. And he's a bit disappointed, but he's sort of thinking, well, actually, it's a lot of responsibility. The more you have, the more you've got to lose. 
you know, the more skilled I'm going to have to be in order to handle that well. And there are principles in our life that, as the scripture says, those who are faithful with little, be faithful with much. You know, it's easier to tithe 10 pence on a pound pocket money than it is to tithe 10,000 pounds on a 100,000 pound gift. The principle, if you're not doing it when you get a pound, you're not going to do it when you get 100,000. Because there's a faithfulness factor here. And I wonder what the third servant felt when he looked at just one talent. And he's looking at the others with these big bags of gold. He's just got one. Still a lot. 20 years worth of salary. This was not, this was not pocket money. This was real stuff. And I wonder whether he looked and thought, he doesn't think much of me. And the sense of injustice of the moment, the sense of being discriminated, the sense of, I don't get the opportunities that other people get. I don't get set up in the way that other people, I don't have the favor that other people have. And suddenly begin to go into retreat. Say, "Ah, I'm out of here. And it wasn't the financial return that the master was so concerned about the third person. It was his laziness. It was that he wasted an opportunity. It was that he didn't try. You know, how much effort would he have taken to go to a bank and just pop it on to a deposit account? There was a laziness. There was a lip service. Master, I will do anything for you. Yes, master, anything you ask, I will do. Look after this one talent. Oh, I'm going to bury it. And there's a a moment in our lives, and it's called our day. And our day could at any moment have the master provide an opportunity for us. Any minute, any moment, it may come in the next few minutes for you. If you don't know Jesus here this morning, you are about to get an opportunity where you can change that. It may come at the coffee break after the service and a conversation. Somebody begins to share how they have got a pain and an illness. And you have an opportunity to be a steward of that moment. And to say, can I pray with you? I remember when I worked in an accountancy office many years ago. And I remember my supervisor, she was always complaining. She was always having a tough deal in life. And she came in, she was having terrible back pain. And I felt God say, just ask her to pray for her. And I didn't. I missed the opportunity. I wasted it. I blew it. It didn't feel profound. But I wonder if I had prayed for her, whether it would have been profound. I've repented of that. And I'm sure, like me, you can tell many stories in your life of those opportunities that you have missed, that I have missed. Maybe because of fear. Maybe because of a sense of injustice that we wanted a bigger opportunity. We wanted to have more. Other people seem to get all the big platforms and the big opportunities and the big amounts of praise. And so I'm not going to do this little thing that doesn't feel very consequential. And Hudson's mum locked herself in a room and she prayed. Whitfield stepped out of his disappointment into a field. And I wonder what moments, what opportunities come in our lives that we can skip over. What if you understood that every opportunity that comes our way is for the Lord? That business deal, that career choice, that moment to encourage someone, that you're not going to encourage them so they think you are a jolly nice chap encouraging them. Oh, what a lovely person is. They're so encouraging. Yay, all the praise and the glory goes to them because they're so lovely. But that every opportunity is an opportunity for worship. It's an opportunity for us to stand in the moment and to say, for God 
for my master, I've been entrusted with this moment. And for God, I am going to step right into this moment. And for God, I'm going to give him all the glory in this moment. And I'm going to trust him. And it's going to involve risk. I may be rejected, but I'm going to take that risk. Scripture says, blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, I'm a bit worried that we're not persecuted enough in this country, not that I'm asking or wanting it, but we've probably camouflaged ourselves a little bit too much. We blend in. And God's not called his church to blend in, he's called us to stand out, not because we're weird. You know, I've heard Christians in the past say, oh, you know, I'm being persecuted, I got a car park ticket when I was at church this morning. That wasn't persecution, that was stupid parking. <laughs> Stop blaming things on persecution that are our own fault. But I wonder when was the last time we were persecuted for righteousness sake? Wonder when the last time that you stood up for something because the ethical call that's within you, because the kingdom of God, what he's doing in you, you stand up for it and you get a bit of a tough time. You see, we take the risk, but God gets the glory. And it's the moment that really tests us as to whether we are his people, his servants. There's a, a lot of buzz around about servant leadership at the moment. People talk about, there's books on servant leadership, there's conferences on servant leadership. Really, if we're talking about um, God's leadership, we don't have to put the word servant in there because it's, it's part and parcel. Yeah. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. Yeah. And if he can serve, so can you, so can I. Yeah. I don't lead this church from a position of, I've got a title, do you know I'm the lead pastor? That's not, that's not why I lead the church. I'm here to serve you guys. I'm here to build you up and empower you yeah. so that you can be a better servant of Christ. We are church. We are servants to the master, to the most high God. And it comes to opportunities. And there are times we just keep waiting for the big opportunity. And it doesn't come. The five talents doesn't seem to come our way. And we need to use the one to be faithful in the small things. Things that will rob us, claiming it's not fair. Why don't I get the same opportunities as the others? Actually, there was a real fairness about this. Because they all had the same chance to be entrusted. It was, it was not owned by anybody. They weren't given unequal gifts they were entrusted with someone else's possessions there was fairness and the reward for the person who invested two talents was the same as the reward for the person who invested five that was in paradise entering into God's kingdom secondly thing that will cause us to be robbed is that we try and get ourselves a cut of the deal we try and take some glory. We looked at this the other week and we looked at Babel together. God help us to not want any of the glory for us as a church. God help us for building a kingdom of river church. And may it be the kingdom of God that we're building for his glory. Not so that people will look at us and say, wow, what a great church. I want people to want to come here, not because they just get a great welcome, because they hear preaching of God's word, not just because they have great worship experience, but because people love Jesus and they're blown away by his greatness and his power and what he's doing in our lives. Thirdly, the thing that will rob us is fear or laziness. Galatians 6 verse 10 says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Let's do good to all. Let's not franchise out goodness to a select group of people. Let's not say, oh, love out loud do that. 
You can't franchise out kindness and care and compassion. Could be your opportunity, could be your talent opportunity to be good and faithful. Ephesians 5, 16 says, make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Colossians 4, 5 says, be wise in the way that you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Tomorrow, Monday morning, some of you will be sat in lecture halls, some of you will be in workplaces, some of you will be traveling on the road and you'll be sitting opposite someone on the train or next to someone on an airplane. And you will, it'll just be a Monday morning. You'll feel like you always do. A little bit anxious about the week ahead. Maybe a bit of reflection on the previous day. We're looking out the window thinking, look at this sunshine, I've got to go to work. You might have all those regular feelings. But if you have an opportunity radar up, and suddenly that person who sits opposite you, that looks a bit grumpy, doesn't look like they've, this, they're not falling on their knees and saying, what must I do to get saved? They're just sitting next to you reading the paper. And it could be an opportunity. You're in your lecture, and your lecturer says something that swipes at Christianity. You think, I wish he hadn't said that. But it may be an opportunity for you to go to him and say, what pain is in your heart to cause you to say that? Maybe an opportunity. Friday, I was coming to a meeting here in the evening and front door knocked. And we live in a three-story house and the, when you arrive, it looks like a bungalow because t- the top floor is where the front door is and our living room's downstairs. So when someone knocks on the door, it's, it feels quite a sacrifice to answer it. I'll just let you know that now. <laughs> you, you know, flights of stairs. I'm thinking of replacing the stairs with a lift shaft at some point. And I open the door and there's two really nice smiling guys wearing nylon suits and badges saying elder and um, hi we're from America (laughs) that's not what it sounds like (laughs) in fact I made a commitment that I would never ever try and do an impersonation in public so I've just broken that and you were here for that moment and I and I'm thinking oh time come on I haven't got time for this I've got to get to a meeting and and I just thought, oh, I'm going to, this is a moment. It's an opportunity. In fact, it's a bit like National Cult Weekend in our street because the Jehovah's Witnesses were out yesterday as well. <laughs> but I spent some time with them. And I loved them. And I said, guys, I'm impressed with your commitment, the sacrifices you've made. But you're wrong. And we just spent time talking until one of them mentioned he was a Nottingham Forest fan. At that point, I just closed the door. <laughs> no, no, I'm joking. But opportunities come in various shapes and sizes. And I wonder at that, because we don't know the hour that the Lord returns. Because if you read the context of the other two stories, it's a lot about the return of our Lord. It's about being ready. I grew up with preaching that said, What if the Lord returns and finds you in the cinema? (gasps) That's it. Damnation. You were watching Toy Story when the Lord returned. Shocking. He's going to reject you forever for being in such a den of iniquity. See, I I don't believe that's what God's concerned about. If it's causing you to sin, he's concerned about it. But, you know, watching Woody affectionately attached to his owner, Andy, it's not particularly what he's concerned about. If that causes you to sin, then let's meet up. <laughs> let's chat. Let's have a pastoral session, just you and I. We'll process some of those significant moments in your life and we'll talk about it. But I believe what he will be concerned about when he returns 
It's what have we done with his name? How have we used our lives for his glory? The investments that he's placed within us, how have we used them for him? I believe that's what you'd be really interested in.